the other person can have, let's say, a red mark or a scratch. Hey everybody, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you're seeing this, this is David Kohlmeyer, The Problem Solver. Welcome today to today's show of The Problem Solver. Every single week we are solving problems here at the Sticky Paws studio in Las Vegas and we are basically going to help different people in different ways. We have special guests every single week basically that are helping different people today. We have an, a, a special guest who's an attorney at law. His name is William Devine who basically is going to be talking about several different uh uh, practicing practicing law basically in several different ways, um, helping people whether it's bankruptcy, um, whether it's um, business formations, estate planning, wills, probate, all kinds of different things. Gets a little advanced, but we're going to basically try, try to figure out exactly what he's doing to help people in general. Um, as usual, every single week we have you know different people on helping people. I personally, as a retired police officer of 17 years. Um, have tons of resources to help different people, and I have a legal network now basically called Las Vegas Legal Network that's helping people, uh, referring people to different attorneys that are helping people uh, whatever specific legal problem they have. Uh, we also have an app basically called the Problem Solver Vegas, which is an app with full of resources and uh, can help different people in Las Vegas, North Las Vegas, and Henderson, Clark County residents, and possibly all of the United States if you have you know different types of problems. Again, I'm Dave Colmeyer, the problem solver, and welcome to the show. Today we have special guest uh, William Devine, who's an attorney practicing in Las Vegas, and I appreciate you coming today on the show. Sure, appreciate you having me on the show, Dave. So, William, tell me a little bit about yourself. So, viewers, listeners, um, how long you've been in Vegas? Tell us just a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, born and raised in uh, well, just outside of Houston, Texas. Um, I grew up in a really small town. Um, moved back to Houston after after college. Did uh, uh, technical technical consulting, so computers, networks, internet, and uh, moved to Las Vegas with my wife and I in 2004 uh, to go to law school. So I went to UNLV for law school and did the dual uh, JD MBA, so basically law school during the day and MBA program at night. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Was so I was night. So was it like accelerated program, like three years or something? Uh, yeah, it was three and a half years. Um, so it ended up being about three and a half years, including uh, every summer. So basically, you get the MBA plus the law degree. Correct. I really like that a lot. There's actually a friend of mine, Steve Hawks, who does real estate. He actually has like the MBA plus real estate, and I think the business um, and legal services kind of goes hand in hand. Yeah, uh, with the when you do the dual degree, um, some of your some of your law school classes ap apply for the uh, degree program for the MBA and, and vice versa. Um, I didn't get to do some of the really cool classes, the um, stock and finance, uh, advanced finance courses, but um, it's sort of a law degree with a minor in MBA, I guess. So, how long have you been practicing law now? Uh, 2008. Uh, April of 2008, so about 13, 13 and a half years. Awesome. And what made you, um, what is your, I know you basically cover a lot of different things in general. What are, what did you start out doing and what are you currently doing today? What so do you my, like my background, um, I have a bachelor's in electrical engineering and a minor in high energy particle physics. So I was supposed to be a physics major, um, high energy physics, working on the super collider in Waxahachie, Texas, but that, that went to heck. Um, so I ended up uh, switching to electrical engineering. Okay. And um, if you're an electrical engineer and you go to law school, you want to be a patent attorney. So I did, I did that for about a year and a half, almost two years. Found out that uh, most of my clients were businesses, and I didn't feel like I was using what I went to law school for. And so I ended up uh, uh, switching out of that. I uh, joined a friend of mine in a private practice and been doing bankruptcy, civil lit, probate, uh, trust, and everything uh, since then. Awesome. So just to recap, I have here Chapter 7 Bankruptcy. I have Nevada Asset Protection Trust, Irrevocable Trust, um, Business Formations of LLCs, Estate Planning, which is Wills Trust, Financial Power of Attorney, Medical Power of Attorneys, and Living Wills, and Probate. You cover all those items? Correct. It most, it, the idea is it's mostly financial related. Financial um, so related. So again, okay. background engineering, you know, four years of math above most of my law school, law school uh, classmates. And so um, I, I deal with things that have rules like rules, rules are good. Um, so uh, bankruptcy, um, anything related to finance. Um, I do civil litigation, business litigation, but um, uh, primarily for ex existing clients. Okay. So, you know, let's just talk, you know, I always find, so even, even though I was a cop for 17 years and I basically, I would say I'm in the law firm legal help, you know, business for the last almost seven years. I kind of feel like when I, even when I was a cop, you know, I mean, I studied law in regards to criminal. I, I really never fully understood all these. You always hear people talk about like bankruptcy and, 7, 13, these different numbers. I mean, you really have no clue unless you basically have that problem. 
And I think basically, you know, I think it's great like when you when attorneys give free consultations and meet with people because they just don't know, you know, in general. So um, for Chapter 7 bankruptcy, tell me a little bit about like, you know, because the viewers and listeners, some have no clue about, you know, bankruptcy and how that would work or how someone even would get into the situation of bankruptcy, um, Chapter 7. Tell me just some of your thoughts and ideas about, you know, people that when they, how they hit bottom and basically they, they need to go to Chapter 7 bankruptcy. And maybe I think before the show you mentioned maybe sometimes they don't, even though they think they should. Yeah, um, um, if you go to an attorney that does bankruptcy and solely bankruptcy, the answer is always going to be file bankruptcy. So I'm, I'm normally not in the business of telling people not to file, but I, I have to do that regularly. So we've got a, a potential client coming to me, has a problem. Um, they often want a second opinion. Um, they were told that they need it by their friends, family, um, you know, family, friends, an attorney, whatever, um, that they need to file bankruptcy. Uh, it turns out that if they do, it you know, can cause serious problems. Um, so, uh, uh, but usually, generally the idea is an individual, you have a chapter seven, 13, um, and the high net worth individuals or mini moguls often real estate wise, um, do chapter 11 <coughs> as an individual, but primarily it's a seven and a 13. So, where, so I put myself in the situation, like where would I be at in my life that I would need a chapter seven bankruptcy that, that I basically have no money, lost my job. I'm like in debt, like give me the scenario, give me the example of, you know, I mean, a typical John Doe. Yeah. So, I mean, a typical Typical uh, client for Chapter 7, generally working, um, they, ha they experience some sort of loss, um, either um, a recent divorce, which often is, causes financial issues as well. Um, they experience a loss, um, loss of a job, um, they, or the job that they have, they can't pay their uh, credit card bills. Um, they had a medical problem uh, here in the U.S. We have, you know, uh, if you have medical insurance, it doesn't cover 100% of everything. Um, so we often have a major emergency that you have a $10,000 deductible, you can't cover it. Um, you have, you know, a major accident, um, you're, you know, you lose your case and you have a bunch of medical bills. Um, and it often happens that, uh, when they have that, um, you know, they get sued in the state of Nevada, you can garnish wages. So they get sued, they get their wages garnished or they get their bank account, uh, bank account garnished and get a lien on their house. Um, so it's not necessarily people that are completely down and out, downtrodden, um, don't have a place to live couch surfing. This is, we, we've got clients that, you know, attorney with five kids making $200,000 a year. Chapter seven, mm -hmm. um, you've got um, an individual, a lot of casino workers uh, before before pandemic hit that um, making forty thousand, forty five thousand dollars a year still file bankruptcy um, because they've got uh, um, certain types of debts, IRS debt, for example, um, or yet someone that had a failed business. That's a really common problem as well, um, especially now. If someone has a failed business, um, their business debt exceeds their, their consumer debt, individual debt. Um, they can still file chapter seven, even if they make, you know, eighty thousand dollars a year. Has anything changed because of COVID and what, what's taken place that um, I know people are receiving unemployment or pandemic unemployment assistance, PUA, um, in regards to bankruptcy? I mean, are we finding more people doing Chapter 7 or like is the government jumped in and said, hey, you know, because of COVID, we're doing this or we're doing that. So you don't do Chapter 7. I mean, you know, honestly, you have probably the lowest number of uh, Chapter 7 bankruptcies in, in, in the nation since the, uh, the law changed in 2005, so um, there's a major uptick right before the law changed, major down right after, right after it changed in 05, um, huge, huge revamp of bankruptcy law. Um, it's at the lowest level now. Um, I've got clients that normally clients would, would rush to a bankruptcy attorney because they're getting their wages garnished um, or their car's about to get repossessed or their home's about to be foreclosed. Um, not necessarily they're about to be evicted from an apartment uh, for, from a home, but that's also another thing. Um, they're getting uh, sued for everything, and, and they get serious, serious uh, credit problems, uh, serious problems. Well, um, if you can't be, if, if you have a, a, a foreclosure, can't happen uh, if you're federal loan during this pandemic. Um, if you're, there was a period of time where wages couldn't be garnished. Um, the CDC eviction moratorium uh, hits, that got renewed for another month, so it's till the end of this month. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of the pain points that bankruptcy helped people stop um, are being deferred uh, during this pandemic. Um, so I, I have had some clients that have come through that have recently got their wages garnished or bank account garnished. Um, so we're seeing an uptick on that now. But uh, for, for probably the last 12 to 14 months, um, people don't have a reason to do bankruptcy um, because the, the reason why to stop a garnishment, to stop a foreclosure, stop a repo, um, hasn't been happening uh, nearly as much as it, as it used to. Hmm. What about, you know, um Everyone always complains, even attorneys and people with student loans. Does Chapter 7 or is there any type of bankruptcy that helps you? You know, I mean, like, I've heard people have, like, just extreme amount of debt. It kind of concerns me for the future of my children. 
you know, you go to law school, you come, actually met with a doctor the other day, and him and his wife, you know, I think owe half a million dollars or something, you know, in student debt. Does any of the bankruptcy covers that? That'd be funny if you're a doctor, a lawyer, you basically, you know, use the law to basically get rid of the... Uh, you, I wish. If, if the, the Any instant, strategies behind that? You know, whatever one of the student the, loans? The instant, federal? the instant student loans get dischargeable, I have a line out the door. Um, the issue you've got is the, the, the threshold is so, so high um, to be able to get a discharge a federal student loan. Um, it has, you have to show that the, prob, the, financial, sorry, the prob, financial problem you're having now is going to persist, um, that if you had to pay um, anything at all to your student loans, that you, you couldn't have a minimal subsistence living, um, and that you, you've, whatever problem you're having is not going to ever change. So if you're, you know, you're a doctor or a lawyer or went to law school, went to medical school, and the person, um, uh, that person got into an accident, brain damage, never going to be a doctor again, never going to be a lawyer again, um, or went to a not a very good medical school, not a very good law school, can never pass their uh, uh, medical exams, to, I mean, their, their medical license requirements, or can never become an attorney, um, worked as a legal assistant or paralegal, and can never pay $150,000 in student loans. If, if they've tried three or four or five times, can't do it, they're done, potentially yes. Um, if you have private student loans, though, um, so you have student loans that are federally backed, um, federally insured. Now they're almost all direct loans. If the loan was dispersed to the university to pay towards your student, your student debt, I'm sorry, your student costs, um, tuition, et cetera, and then the excess was refunded to you, um, that's basically never going to get discharged, um, absent the undue, undue hardship that you're going to prove. Um, if the loans were paid to you directly, um, generally that is something that um, the loans exceed your cost of, cost of attendance. Those are dischargeable in, in, in a bankruptcy. Um, if you can prove that uh, those loans are additional um, and they exceeded the cost of attendance and they didn't come from a nonprofit. So if they came from a private company, private lender, and they exceeded your cost of attendance, <laughs> cost of attendance then uh, potentially can get rid of those. I'm laughing because it gets so advanced. Yeah, yeah, it's very, and, and so the the the, the lenders sounds that, like you need an attorney to, hit, to decide for this. Yeah, the lenders that are private nonprofit now, so mm -hmm. that makes it makes it much difficult. So the bottom line is, is that if you're going through some financial times, something that you personally do, and I know you're now with our Las Vegas Legal Network, I know you do free consultations, and I think you mentioned that you do free strategy sessions as well for people helping people. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, I mean, if someone's coming in and have a final financial problem, it's often often it bankruptcy is not their answer. Um, so often we can we can do some things um, like if you're if you're you're retired and your sole income is Social Security, VA disability, a pension, military pension, federal pension, mm -hmm. um, private pension, um, and that's your sole source of income. Creditor can't touch you. So you, you could do a bankruptcy if you wanted to, um, but there's not uh, other than stopping the collectors the collections coming from calling you and harassing you. Um, there's not a an actual benefit uh, to a bankruptcy. So are you? So basically, you would sit down with somebody. You would say, "Bring all your financial paperwork. Let me review basically before you basically make a decision, right?" Correct. And you sit down, go to the paper, and say, yeah, "I think you should do. I think you shouldn't." Correct. Well, you know, in Vegas, you know, there's a lot of attorneys, basically a lot of billboards and so on. I always see like one or two billboards which says like bankruptcy, and it's like six ninety nine or something like that. In general, it just seems like really, really cheap. What's your thoughts with people when you see these billboards? Is it like a la carte? Like when you see a billboard that seems too good to be true, and I, for some reason you always see it with, like with bankruptcy. Like they're trying to show that it's really cheap to to basically you know hire an attorney for bankruptcy. What's your thoughts with something like that, or the signage, or billboards for bankruptcy specific that seems so cheap? It's like they're trying to entice you to basically go, go bankrupt. Well, that, uh, like what's a normal fee for someone to do a Chapter Seven bankruptcy? I mean, you're running, legal services. Uh, you're always going to have low cost leaders. So you're always going to have the companies that are going to charge you 600, 700 bucks to do it. Um, uh, maybe high volume, primarily the paralegal is doing most of it. Uh, bankruptcy special is doing the majority of it. Um, if you want to talk to an attorney, you call. You'll never actually get to the, get to speak to the attorney. Um, you have you know five or six rooms. You walk by and say, "Hi, my name is you know John Attorney," um, and that, that that acts as the, uh, the 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 contact with the attorney. Mm -hmm. um, the problem you have with that is uh, there's a lot of questions that. Um, can cause serious problems if they are not asked. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll, you'll, you'll run into problems where um, I get, I've get i got friends of mine that do bankruptcy, do specifically Chapter 7 bankruptcy, easier ones, the lower price, easier ones. Uh, they refer me to the little more complex ones. Um, and because they didn't ask a question, you know, they moved here to Las Vegas, they don't ask, they, they don't, you know, don't, don't determine if they, if they did own a property or they own a half of half their names on a property in, in the state of Washington or Oregon or California. Um, they file a bankruptcy, and um, the trustee finds it. 
um, as a client didn't even know about it, um, uh, or client knew about it but didn't think it was important. Um, you don't go through, they, they don't go through the bank statements looking to find out, you know, there's a whole lot of cash withdrawals. What are they for? Ask the client about. Um, because if you're charging $600 or $700 for bankruptcy, you don't have the time to do that. That, mm -hmm. that efficiency doesn't work. Um, so you'll find that on the lower, if, if you're a straight Chapter 7, you work, you have an income, you have credit cards, your life is, honestly, plain, life, normal, um, the average person, um, yes, a $600 bankruptcy, $700 bankruptcy would be fine. Um, if you have a business, oh, God, no. No, if you if you ever operated a business, um, if you ever paid yourself out of a business, either W-2 or self-employed, um, never. I don't, well, I can't say never, but I would not recommend that. Um, I mean, basically, the more things you have or the more assets or, you know, the bigger the bankruptcy, I mean, it's going to be more advanced and more work to be done. Correct. And so, you're going to find that a $7 bankruptcy attorney is not going to do it for you. Got it. I just, I, I just feel a little weird sometimes when I see a billboard and it's like kind of in trying to entice people to do bankruptcy because it's a low fee to basically get out of debt and so on, but it may not be the, you know, the best thing. And then what is it now? Like it's seven years for bankruptcy or something like that? What is it? So it shows up in your credit report for, uh, for 10 years. Um, for 10 years. Uh, it doesn't affect you for 10 years, but it shows in your credit report for 10 years. Um, you can't file a Chapter 7 again for eight years after the first filing. Um, and the reason, the reason I say it doesn't affect you for 10 years is generally after you, you file your bankruptcy, your discharge comes out roughly three, three and a half months after the after Chapter Seven is filed, um, but during that time you'll get letters from car lenders uh, on Auto Show, uh, Auto Show Boulevard. You'll get letters from Tobin Dodge. You'll get letters from Nissan um, saying when your bank when discharge comes out, come see us. Um, you'll get uh, offers from credit card companies. Um, you know, get these five hundred dollar sort of predatory credit cards. Five hundred dollars, pay dollars to get the card. Yeah, get the credit card. Um, you'll get those um, in the middle of your bankruptcy. So. And you're trying to, if you don't have a foreclosure going through it, in a couple of years, the FHA doesn't even care if you did the bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, have you had a bankruptcy that, has, that hasn't been discharged in the last two years? No. So you don't care. Um, so generally, after two years, um, assuming that you've got your life back on track, financial life back on track, um, and you've used credit responsibly, haven't turned around and simply repeated the mistakes you've had mm -hmm. um, that brought you there, um, credit score would be 650, 680, 700. Um, and no one really cares um, if you had a bankruptcy in the last uh, 10 years. But if you're applying for a home, which has been a while since I spoke with a mortgage agent about this, but if you're applying for a home, I mean, it doesn't affect you for 10 years, the bankruptcy? Or no. I think they wait two or three years, right? So after Correct. two years, they could actually apply for a Correct. home. Correct. If you've had a, if you've had a uh, foreclosure, um, that will, if you surrendered a, surrendered a house in the, in the bankruptcy or you had a repossession, I'm uh, sorry, a foreclosure on a house um, during the bankruptcy or prior to the bankruptcy that you discharged, mm -hmm. um, it's going to be three years, maybe four years, but, um, or short sale. Got it. Um, but if you didn't have a repossession or foreclosure after two years, then you generally don't care. And then banks, uh, if you're not getting an FHA back, then shoot, you'll have one sooner than that, um, as long as you have the, the funds set aside to do it. Or a retirement account you can pull money from if you wish to do that. Because retirement money, even if you do the bankruptcy, Chapter 7, your bankruptcy, I'm sorry, your like 401k plan still is intact, right? Yes. So you're from Nevada. Uh, well, federally, 401k is exempt because it's federally exempt. But a uh, Roth IRA, uh, just a traditional IRA. Um, so things that are federally backed, four one k, four three b, pensions are protected, um, deferred comps protected. Um, so the bottom line is, it gets very advanced. Everyone's in a different situation. If you need an attorney, basically to review all your paperwork to see what's the best decision. It's not about the billboard that says six ninety nine to get a bankruptcy because everyone's different. But the bottom line is, they need to sit down, do a consultation, do a strategy session, figure out what's best. Do you deal with any debt consolidation companies? No. <laughs> those are bad, right? No, I mean, those debt, are evil. Debt, uh, a, a debt consolidation company is a, a pre-bankruptcy. Um, if you, uh, you believe in that, you think people should do that as a resource, or I mean, suppose it's high, high interest debt, rate, right? Yeah. So the problem you run into is a debt consolidation. Uh, if it's a, if it's a nonprofit debt consolidation, um, sometimes you can get better. You can get uh, you can get better with that. Better rates um, or something. Uh, well, because it's a, it's they have an agreement with the credit card companies. The credit companies stop charging uh, stop charging interest during this time. Mm -hmm. The payment goes to them, and then it gets divided up. Um, equally to pro rata to the, 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 the credit card companies. Um, debt settlement companies are, <laughs> I was going to say are the devil, but debt settlement companies are normally a bad idea. Um, uh, debt consolidation, if you, can't, if you can't pay your credit cards now and you borrow $45,000 to pay off all your credit cards, um, unless there's a condition that your credit cards have to be canceled, um, your debt consolidation is simply going to be, it's going to double your, your balance because you're going to pay off 45 grand and you're going to charge those suckers back up again. That's what usually happens with the debt consolidation. Um, so 
um, with a debt, uh, debt settlement company, um, you pay $500 a month, $800 a month to them. Mm -hmm. They hold it for six months um, until they get enough to settle them, and then they'll start uh, negotiating settlements. But by then, in Nevada, there's four or five uh, creditors that will sue you directly. Once you're nine months past, you get sued, and their answer is, we don't represent you in defending the lawsuit. Got it. So you might as well just file a Chapter 7, stop throwing your money away, and get rid of it and clear your life. So bottom line is, you know, and I appreciate, William, where basically you, you offer the free consultation, a free strategy session. You'll sit down, you'll meet with people, go over their stuff. Gets very, very advanced. You're very detailed, uh, very organized. Uh, you know, you have the whole background of detail and organization, which is amazing. So again, the bottom line is any of the listeners and viewers, basically, if, you, if you're looking for the free consultation, the you know, free strategy session to basically get you some help uh, instead of just putting your head, you know, in the sand. I mean, I definitely would, you know, speak to William and basically go over that. Um... If anyone, again, based listeners and viewers basically need any type of legal help, the Las Vegas Legal Network, which is a toll-free number, which is 1-844-LAWYERS, again, 1-844-LAWYERS, toll-free number throughout the United States. Basically, if anyone needs you know sp specific legal help, like someone like William can help with, basically, you can call that number. We can set up a consultation and basically go from there. Let's jump into um, Nevada Asset Protection Trust, which is kind of interesting. Here's a good question for you. So when I met with somebody once at a seminar, they were saying how that if you're going to go bankruptcy, that you should put money or a house into a trust to protect yourself. And I think it had to be seasoned for two years because basically if you don't own it, but you control it through a trust, that it's a way to protect yourself. This was during the time where people were doing the, um, I forgot what it was called already. They were trying to, um, what is it, like buy another I forgot what they were doing. When the home, when the, when the market changed, they were trying to put like homes into these asset protection trusts. I think so they can, um, oh, so they could do the bankruptcy, but then also protect their assets. What are your thoughts about, uh, that, that gets a little advanced. But you yeah. know what I'm saying? We, yeah. If it's seasoned for two years. Yeah, so that, the season two because years. Because they don't own it, right? The home is in the trust. The seasoning for two years is in Nevada law. Mm -hmm. um, so bankruptcy obviously trumps Nevada law. Um, and so you create an asset protection trust, you transfer your, wouldn't re recommend transferring your primary residence, but um, you, can, you can if you wish. Um, but you transfer investment properties into the asset protection trusts. Um, after two years, two years, they're protected from, uh, no court in the state of Nevada um, can ever go after those. Um, so um, the problem you have is bankruptcy got a 10 year look back for that. So if you, if you create a Nevada, what is normally a Nevada Asset Protection Trust, a self-settled spendthrift trust where you create the trust, you're the trustee of it, and you're the beneficiary of it, which Nevada is one of the few states that let you do that, um, you get the use of it, you get the control of it. Um, Even the tax benefit, right? Uh, so the mortgage interest is one issue, um, but, um, uh, but deductions normally, yes. But mortgage interest, you run into problems having in an Asset Protection Trust. Um, but if you're still paying the mortgage, you, still, you have a mortgage on it, and you had it before you transferred it, then yes, you get, the, you get it because you're actually the one paying for it. Um, what you run into, though, is if you transfer a house into a Nevada Asset Protection Trust and then file bankruptcy two years and a day later, uh, the bankruptcy court just takes it back um, because it's a 10-year look back in bankruptcy court. So um, that works against creditors in the state of Nevada. That works against uh, creditors in other states that sue you and then try to register their, their judgment here in Nevada to collect against you. Mm -hmm. Works great. Um, but not in bankruptcy, not bankruptcy court. So tell me, Nevada Asset Protection Trust, um, tell me a little bit about it. Who needs that? So if you have, um, it, again, going back to the primary residence. So Nevada has a really good exemptions for primary residence, six hundred five grand um, in equity uh, protected from judgment creditors. Is that Homestead? Homestead, yeah. Homestead, Homestead. Declaration, yeah. Up to 605. Up to 605. So um, you're, you're protected if it's your own personal home and there's equity up to $605,000. You're protected even through bankruptcy? Even through bankruptcy, correct. Okay. Um, protected from as long as long as the money, obviously the money you used to pay it down, you didn't collect fraudulently, so you didn't you know embezzle it or something. Got it. Um, but uh, you know, so you get sued, um, they get a judgment against you, they record the judgment against you. Nevada law says the judgment attaches to any non-exempt equity. So title companies pay attention to that. Um, title companies have a problem with this; they don't quite understand that. Um, if a lien is on the property, even if it's 100% exempt, title companies will require you to do bankruptcy or go to court and get it undone, which by Nevada law does not require that. Talking to you title companies. Um, I rented that all the time. Um, uh, so yeah, so someone files a bankruptcy, they have less than 605 in equity, you get to keep the house, no issues, assuming obviously they can continue to pay for it. Um, you get uh, you know a lot of furniture, a lot of equipment, um, money, et cetera. Um, so if you have assets that exceed the uh, judgment exemptions, the same exemptions we use in Nevada uh, bankruptcy court to determine if you, what you get to keep, 
if, you're, if your assets uh, exceed that, um, you can transfer those into the Nevada Asset Protection Trust. Um, you can continue to manage it. You'll be the trustee of. You have to have a blocking trustee, a th a somewhat disinterested third party that uh, has the ability to stop certain things from happening, um, which is what provides you with the asset protection on it. Um, so you've got that. And so if you're someone that touches, well, not physically touches, but in the business on a day-to-day -day basis, interacts with multiple, with a bunch of people that, um, on a regular basis, doctors, lawyers, dentists, chiropractors, realtors, brokers, um, anyone who does a lot of transactions in their life mm -hmm. um, that are, that are um, subject them to potential liability. So you're a realtor, you find out that your, uh, your client uh, misrepresented some things and they, you didn't look into it, um, you were sloppy on it, potentially liable. Same with a broker. Um, your doctor gets sued from our practice, your lawyer gets sued from our practice, um, you're a chiropractor, a dentist, et cetera. Um, and so that is, you, if you have, you, you want to protect your nest egg um, from uh, any potentially larger liabilities. So you put them in an asset protection trust before you get sued, right? Mm -hmm. So don't, don't, you know, you get sued and you're like, okay, now I need to protect my stuff. You should consider doing it ahead of time. Um, so you do it before. So then two years and, you know, a day later, um, something, something bad happens, you get in a car accident, you get sued for breach of contract in a business, um, you get sued for malpractice for, for something whatsoever. Um, major car accident that exceeds your liability in your car insurance. Um, they can't touch it. So do you believe, when I was a cop, I used to pull people over, and you'd always see the registered owner as being a trust. Mm -hmm. That's Is that because if you got into an accident, you killed someone, that the car is not, doesn't it go back onto the driver? So I would never recommend someone do that in Nevada. To um, put the car in the trust? That daily driver, it's just rolling liability. Because, um, I mean, in Nevada, in most states, the driver's insurance is responsible first. Mm -hmm. um, if the driver's insurance isn't enough to cover the liability. So, so you can get, a, get an accident, you hit a van that's got seven kids in it, um, uh, and their parents make $10 million a year. Children are worth what their parents make. So the more your parents make, the more potential you have in the eyes of the insurance company. Um, so you get in a car accident, and you kill a bunch of kids, um, that kills you, and your trust owns your car. Your trust is now responsible for anything in excess of what your, your car insurance covers. I used to see it quite a bit. I was always, I never really understood and so living, living trusts, um, living trusts offer no asset protection whatsoever. So, uh, well, generally no asset protection whatsoever while you're alive. So is it a living trust maybe? Yeah, more than likely it's going to be a living trust. And um, what was the reason why a car would be a living trust? To avoid probate um, without thinking that um, if they get in an accident that kills them and kills the driver, the owner of the vehicle, um, and the liability for the accident Exceed, <coughs> exceeds their personal car insurance that they're now exposing all of their assets in the trust to the accident liability, which is why I would never put uh, a vehicle that you, that you drive on a daily basis into a trust. You simply have good insurance. Mm -hmm. So wait a second, you're saying that you don't believe that anyone should put a car into any type of trust? If it's your driver that you drive to work, and, and all, you, Nevada, you get a 15 grand exemption for vehicle, so, um, which is not, I mean, it's not massive, but got you know, you've got an $80,000 Mercedes, um, you, drive to, you drive to work, um, it's a daily driver if it's owned by your if it's owned by a living trust, um, and you get an accident that kills you. you all your assets in the trust are now exposed to that. If you're so going to why, why do you people do that? Like, I've seen that. Why, why I, do people no don't? No idea. Okay. Have you heard that before? Yeah, no. I, the Nevada DMV even has a, even, has, even has a form to do that for you. Okay, if you if you want to if you want to put an expensive vehicle in a trust, um, have the trust own an LLC and have the LLC own the vehicle. Um, so you have the ability to pr avoid probate by doing that. Um, I can't imagine someone's like thinking about probate with like registering a car and putting into a living trust, you know, for an average car. I used to I mean, see you, quite I've a got bit. a friend of mine that does a lot of collection Volkswagens. Um, mm -hmm. um, we did. He sold a bunch of them, but uh, Volkswagens, um, collectors' cars. Those are perfect. So you drive them to the show, um, an hour to the show, or you trailer them more than likely. You mean, so really, is just in case it's considered like an asset mm -hmm. that basically putting it in a living trust is helping avoid probate. Correct. That's the so primary, right, primary primary reason for the living trust is to avoid probate. It just seems weird. Like I would never be thinking like, oh, let me worry about my probate with my car. You know, like, you but know, I mean, if you have if you have a two hundred thousand dollar car, maybe someone older. You know, and if you got a two hundred thousand dollar two hundred thousand dollar car that you're driving, um, I still would not put it in your trust. Um, I would put it in an LLC owned by your trust. That works great. An LLC. So if I added a two hundred thousand dollar car, put the car should be registered in an LLC, and the LLC should be in the trust. Yep. And that works perfectly. And the reason why you do that is liability for it, LLC it, the, the, the LLC protects the trust from liability caused by the driver and for the car. Got it. Um, and it also because the, the LLC is owned by the by the trust, the trust passes the, the ownership um, outside of probate. And so you get best of both worlds. But in the trust itself, 
you're just exposing the trust of liability if you drive a car around. I was that because I just feel like it just gets so advanced, you know. And the thing with it is that people don't have money for legal services to do all this stuff, you know, the place of trust and this and living will and then, you know, put this in the LLC or series LLC, you know, and like it just gets really advanced. I mean, every time I talk about it, I just kind of gets nauseous because, you know, even if you own a bunch of real estate, like some people say, do you get a separate LLC for every single home because if someone basically, you know, breaks mm -hmm. the bone or dies in the swimming pool, or do you get a series LLC, right, even though it's like separate, but everyone has different theories about it. And then do you get a basically asset protection trust to protect you because all the homes, like, you need all these layers. If they, I mean, it gets very advanced. Yeah, series. I mean, series LLCs work great. Um, problems you're running into is uh, uh, banks, uh, national banks have a problem with opening a bank account under a series LLC. So they give you they give you crap about that. I kind of feel like it just pays to be individually, but I think it's less money, right? There's less fees if you yeah, do a series yeah. so LLC. A series LLC, you um, you have one effectively a master LLC, and then, and then uh, you parent, save parent, money, right? A parent and children. So you pay um, you pay three hundred dollars a year to the state of Nevada, uh, Nevada Secretary of State, to renew it. Um, and you have multiple series. You don't renew. You don't have to pay renewals for the series. You don't have to register them with the state of Nevada. Um, it's just a separate operating agreement for each series. Um, if you're, you can have, you can assign the parent as the manager. Um, and so in Nevada, you have legal uh, separation between the series. Mm -hmm. um, other states don't recognize. A lot of most states don't recognize it. Okay. So, so I would, I'd avoid that if you, uh, um, if you plan on having a bunch of properties that are going to be rented. You can just have a manager, a, op, a management company that manages the, uh, the operations for the, L, the uh, sub, uh, series LLCs. So you don't need a bank account for each series, and then that avoids that problem. And, but, it, but they work great as far as uh, real estate ownership. Got it. All right. So anything else in regards to Nevada Asset Protection Trust? The bottom line is if you have assets and properties, whether it's a living trust, Nevada Asset Protection Trust, I mean, if you have stuff, there's has got to figure out exactly what you got going on in order to avoid, like, probate or basically just to protect yourself, God forbid, you know, Someone got killed, or if you want to protect your property, everyone's different, right? So it's the same thing. You got to sit down with a bunch of paperwork and figure out what your strategy is for your life and for your family and for what assets you basically have, right? Correct. Yeah, the most common uh, use in my, in my practice is with a Nevada Asset Protection Trust is you create the trust. Um, the trust, we then create a holding company or an operating company, depending if they're open, running a business inside the trust um, that hires them as the manager or uh, it, it owns real estate. Um, so you have the trust itself, own all, your, own, all, own all of your investment real estate, um, so it's protected from your personal creditors. Your name doesn't show up on it. Um, the uh, the trust does, or the LLC does. I think I'm gonna have to sit down with you with my stuff just to go over because it gets so advanced. I, honestly, I, like most people, I think they just put their head in the sand. With even you know, just you know, people don't want to pay all these fees. They're confused, right? You know, and it just gets to be like nauseating. You know, what you should be doing. And a lot of people, a lot of lawyers, also have different strategies, right? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, you can get. I mean, I, don't th I think in Nevada, because our asset protection trust um, uh, laws are really good, um, you don't hear a lot of Nevada attorneys talking about land trust, um, land tr revocable, revocable trust owned real estate um, that you can assign without recording a deed transfer. Um, so uh, between different entities, uh, different mm -hmm. people. Um, so land trust, I said, are revocable. Um, they're not really asset protection. They're more privacy tools. Um, but Nevada, you get the asset protection trust. The power uh, that it gives you is a lot, lot more than what you get with a normal land trust. Um, so in Nevada, most attorneys, if the choice is between a, a asset protection trust or a land trust, the asset protection trust wins hands down. Got it. All right. Bottom line is, if you need help, again, you're willing to help these people out that have uh, you know different things to go over to basically see what they need to do to Absolutely. protect themselves. All right. Next one is um, business formations of LLC. So basically, if, if someone wants to set up a new company or anything to protect you know, if, if you're involved in a Nevada um, asset protection and you want to create LLCs, that how, how does that work with you? Basically, people can call you and they can set up an LLC to for a house, for anything, right? For any a new business? Yeah, for anything you want. I'd say probably 90% of my LLCs formed are, are associated with a Nevada asset, the asset protection trust. Um, so um, generally, it's, it, rarely do I have a client that buy that, get, that gets just forms just an asset protection trust um, and then titles a bunch of property in that trust. Um, almost, nor, almost always, it's a, you create the asset protection trust, you know, create a holding company, and then transfer you know three, or four houses into it. Um, and then every every house they buy after then, um, they then uh, they buy the you know, investor, for example, buys it cash, invests in the name of the LLC owned by the trust. Um, so I don't have a whole lot of. Uh, I mean, I do I, probably 10, 15 percent of my clients, I guess, would be um, an LLCs without um, a trust, um, but mostly it's with. Got it. You know, I know it gets advanced when you buy homes. One thing that I'll share with you that I've done over the past, which most people don't know, it's kind of a real estate strategy when you're buying real estate. Like if I put my name, Dave Colmeyer and or a signee, a lot of people don't really understand that. And the reason why 
when you're buying something, you could assign the property for real estate to somebody else, and you can get an right. assignment fee if you're not a uh, if you're basically a real Silicon estate contract. investor, right? A lot of people don't understand that, but a lot of times when you submit that paperwork for real estate to um, real estate agents, they'll say, why does it say David Colmeyer and or signee? And the answer would be, hey, I, if, if the offer gets accepted, I want to basically put it into an LLC to protect myself in the home. But if the offer is not going to get accepted, I don't need to create an LLC for that. Correct. But at the same time, I could assign it, which most people don't get unless they've been to investor seminars. So to me, it's really important. Now, most banks are smart. They don't want that and or assignee there. There's always a liability because they, they're smarter to think that I can assign that contract. I mean, it gets more advanced. I mean, luckily, I was in a real estate you know, seminar that talked about this. I've used it before. I was even talking about it today with my wife who does real estate. But it's, you know, like I said, even these little things, these little strategies you know, are really important if you learn them and you know them, depending upon what you do. For the average person that's working, that you, know, you, you may want to open up a business. You may need an LLC and there's tax benefits. But you got to basically get with either. You got to learn and educate yourself. Like I said, that's my one little thing that I know that's helped me personally. But whether you need an attorney to guide you, because everyone's different, right? If you want to buy and sell cars, or if you want to basically open up a, a salon, I mean, there's different liabilities. There's different things you should be doing depending upon you know what type of business or what type of uh, assets you have. Absolutely. But um, so LLCs. The bottom line is you can help people open up an LLC, find out if the name's available. And basically get an LLC started. Whether it's you do series LLCs as well, you do both. I, I do. Um, it's just that again, most of the problems you run into with um, if you own two or three, um, it's not a huge difference. Um, so the, the the reason you look at it is uh, what I try to compare people, what provide comparisons with, is um, it costs you three hundred. Well, we charge four fifty, three fifty for Nevada Secretary of State, hundred dollars for a registered agent service per year. Uh, so four fifty a, a year for renewal. Um, if you have a series LLC. Um, and the cost of the uh, the cost of uh, the insurance that you need um, for all the, all the properties um, exceeds the uh, the cost of separate LLCs. Then do separate LLCs. Um, so if you if you have ten properties, then insurance is always going to be less than ten LLCs a year. Um, if you have uh, three properties, the cost of the LLCs is probably going to be less than the insurance. Um, so often it's better to have you know you can have multiple LLCs instead of um, instead of one entity uh, one entity own multiple properties. Got it. And that's even like myself. I need to get with you because, like I said, I don't even know what I did, you know, for some of the real estate, and um, you know, it gets expensive when you start having other properties mm-hmm. and doing different things. So, the bottom line is, you could sit down with somebody, whether it's a business, whether it's real estate. What else is common for LLC? Like, what else are? No, that's that's, that's so basically that's real, estate real estate and business. Real estate and business, correct. And then if people have assets, holding. Co- I mean, holding company, but holding company normally holds multiple entities or. Generally, holding uh, holding real estate or holding assets. Got it. I've got a client that's got an LLC, owns a two hundred fifty thousand dollars car. That's all he does. It's it's formed solely for that. Got it. All right. Is anything I'm missing with LLCs for people to um, know that you do? Uh, no, no, I think we're good on that one. Okay. All right. That, that's probably the easiest topic of everything. So a state. Um, oh, by the way, one thing I do know with LLCs, which is kind of interesting, which if you want, if you have an idea of setting up a business. Recently, I didn't know about it. You could actually reserve the name of an LLC if it's available, which is I think it's twenty five dollars for ninety days. Right. So actually, I'm working on a project, you know. So I just figured this one out. So instead of spending all this money opening up all these different LLCs, you basically reserve the name every ninety days, and then you basically can renew it, right? So if you have an idea of a business, you can reserve that name. I think it's important. And then I think if you need a DBA for Clark County, I think it's twenty twenty five bucks. Twenty five bucks to get a DBA. Well, they so, can, here they call it a FFN, a fictitious firm name. Got it. But same thing. So. I think it's important if anyone wants to open up a business, whether you have an LLC, if you have an idea, you want to basically just reserve the name of the LLC if it's available, that's $25. I'm sorry, to reserve the name, I think it's $25 for 90 days, and then if you want a DBA, then it's $25. Correct. And that's actually, I think, good for like seven years or something. Uh, DBA, yes, five years. Five yeah. years, long time. Yeah, so the, the issue on the reserve name is, I mean, can you imagine um, you, you and three people to get together and have a great idea for a company, create a name, create a logo, um, get everything started, and then you go to file the comp- create the company, and someone just took it. Um, someone, think, someone's listening to you at the at the store. Goes, you know, that's a great idea. I'll take that name. <laughs> someone told me recently a, a name. I, I didn't really like it that much, but when they told me about, it, I'm like, oh, for twenty five, you know, for twenty five bucks, I can go reserve it every ninety days. I mean, it was okay in you know, the name, but it wasn't something I totally wanted to do. But I was just was laughing because you got to be careful when you have an idea, basically, of who you're sharing with it. Yeah, you hear the joke all the time of you know these annoying kids at a st- annoying kids at Starbucks and talking about their new their new business they're creating, and the guy sits there on his computer and reserves their reserves their domain name or reserves the company and oh the website. Yeah, just because just to piss them off. Yeah. Today I was looking online. There was a website that was something that I wanted. And it was like two thousand dollars, and then I went to something else that was available for twelve dollars. But you got to be careful. Um, 
when you start mentioning uh, domain names because yeah. that's a whole other business as well. A question for you in regards to the, um, oh, DBAs. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to open up a business and you want to open up an LLC, for what I'm being told with the DBAs, fictitious name, that anybody, like if you wanted to call it uh, Sticky Paws, right? Can 10 people have Sticky Paws as a DBA? Yeah, absolutely. I don't understand why that's allowed because that means 10 different people. And I, can, means I, can, I can file a fictitious firm name for, the, for a McDonald's. But I, when, I, if I try to operate one, that's a serious problem. But, but if I, you start marketing that name, then McDonald's the will come after you, right? That's the problem. But I, I don't can understand register, why do they allow you to do that. It doesn't make sense. Well, I mean, imagine McDonald's. Um, McDonald's doesn't own all the, all the restaurants in town. Multiple entities do. Um, there's not one franchisee that owns. There's 10, 15, 20, 100 mm -hmm. franchises. So you may have one franchisee own two or three McDonald's. Um, so they have to have a DBA at McDonald's. This other franchisee has their restaurant. Um, they have to have a DBA at McDonald's. Um, then you have 10 franchisees operating as McDonald's. So they all have to register an FFN for McDonald's. So if you really like a name for a business, you really should go get the LLC name or at least reserve the name, right? Correct. So if you have that, a, that supersedes the DBA, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. So if you have, you have the, uh, I mean, if you have created a company called, you know, John Doe Enterprises, um, it, the Inc. C Corp. LLC, all that does is, is ignored um, as far as the name. Um, so, um, you know, you have uh, John Doe Enterprises and um, you register a DBA of or F F FFN of, you know, mm -hmm. John Doe Operating Company or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you have the LLC. If someone, if someone starts operating as a DBA under your name, you have the ability to stop them from doing that if they're operating in the same business because you have the LLC created. So the goal is to, the thing is it gets more expensive, right? If you have 10 different LLCs and... But I just learned that recently because I think it's an important thing if someone has a business idea that you should basically reserve the name, spend the 25 bucks every 90 days yep. to maintain it, and they don't have that annual fee until you basically set up the LLC. Correct. It gets advanced. I mean, I just that, that's something that I just recently you know learned about. But I think, like I said, it's important if you want to open up a business. So a lot of times you also could do some you know business consulting in regards to names and websites and you know LLCs and reserving the names, right, and all this other good stuff if someone wants to open up a new uh, business. Yeah, yeah. So like, I mean, even Nevada, Talking about what you're talking about, reserving a name. Um, so Nevada lets you re let you file a state trademark. Um, so if you don't, you know, you literally you file it with state of Nevada, pay your hundred bucks. Um, it's effective as soon as you file it, um, and then you can then uh, submit a uh, an application for a federal trademark later if you wish. Um, but uh, you know, you've got the Nevada trademark registered. Someone can't um, who's not selling in Nevada can't now come and operate a business under that name in your in your area, your business service area, your category. Yeah. So is that the, like the R? The R for being for a trademark Nevada, correct, yeah. for the state. So the R circle, which means trademark, right? Well, that's, that's going to be federal, federal registered trademark. <coughs> that's federal. So what if you wanted to do a state trademark, it, what is you the... You just registered the state trademark. So you just registered. But so there's no like small R circle no. next to it? No, not for Nevada. So that means if someone basically wants to run that same type of business in that category, they can't do it because you basically did a state trademark. Correct. As long as you actually operate in the company, you just can't reserve a name. But Can you help with setting up federal trademarks? Uh, we don't. We don't. We don't. No. I see there's some websites that do that as well. Yeah, if, that's so with a small R to basically. Yeah, correct. So nobody throughout the United States of America you could use it in that specific category, right? Correct. So trademarks <clears throat> trademarks are federal, um, so you, you don't have to be located in, in the state where the, where the client is to do the trademark. Mm -hmm. So you'll find um, companies out of California operating you know, trademarks and will create a federal trademark for any client in the, anywhere in the United States. Um, so they're not located. Uh, not, they don't have to be located in your state. So you can just hire a national company to do that, and it's perfectly fine. So give me an example. Like, so why would I want to do a state trademark? Is it to prevent someone from doing that service category with my name? Yeah. If you if you have no, no if, if if you have no you know grandiose desire to uh, to expand U.S. wide, um, and you just simply want to. Protect the sure, name. Protect the name in the state of Nevada. So technically, the studio that I'm in today is basically Sticky Paw Studio. So this this should be a state trademark for Sticky Paw Studio for being what like studio or services, whatever. Yeah, this, a description of whatever communications. Uh, so, and this would prevent somebody down the block to open up another Sticky Paws. Correct. As long, in the same category, if someone wants to open Sticky Paws with a shirt company, that would be different. Maybe it's totally, merchandise. Totally different. Correct. Got it. So any business really should get this state trademark as long specifically if they're trying to just stay within the state. Once they start going national, they should get the federal trademark. Yep. Hmm. That's interesting. Yep. If they want to protect a product. I mean, if you... Because it's very... Yeah, technically, right, right, people can steal the concept and just go somewhere down and there's no state trademark. Well, I mean, if you have, you know... That's the problem. You could open up a DBA. If I, if I opened uh, Las Vegas Little Network... Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you get a, you have an issue with Nevada law does protect me from do, protect you from me doing that. Um, so, it, trademark or not, 
Um, because the LLC's they're, already they're set, the, they're set the business practices. Yeah, you, I can't, I can't put my name on something and act like I'm you and have clients, uh, potential clients, call me and and me take money from you that they would normally they would normally pay mm-hmm. you because they thought I was they thought I was you. Got it. So you have to set the trademark. I'm mean, deceptive uh, uh, business practices in Nevada already. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so if someone were to call themselves Sticky Paul Studio, um, offer this exact same product, and they weren't them, um, you still, even without a trademark, you still have to set the business practices um, law in the state of Nevada. Um, but the uh, trademark helps. Got it. I mean, the bottom line is there's different ways of protecting you in different ways. Absolutely. So, I mean, the bottom line is that's where it comes into play in regards to calling you, especially if you have a new business, right? I mean, w- even if you're leasing a location, maybe it should be an LLC name, not in your name. Mm-hmm. Maybe it should be in a trust or, you know? If you... Uh, what, what's your thoughts about like here? Like if I'm renting, I'm renting a location. Should that be in my LLC name? Right, it protects liability. God forbid something happens, you get sued, someone falls. Right. Yep. So I mean, what the what the law allows and what reality happens is not always the same. Um, so uh, generally, the concept is you would want the LLC to be the one on the, uh, on the lease. Mm-hmm. However, um, a lot of people want the financial guarantee. Yes, lenders, uh, landlords generally want a personal guarantee. See, to me personally, I think you should have the LLC. And then basically you, try, you try sign to, try as to a nego- guarantor, right? Try to negotiate away the guarantee. Um, but if, you, if you've if you never been in business before and you sign a, a lease for something that's three grand a month or four grand a month for a uh, you know, 2,000 square foot or a 1,500 square foot a suite um, and you don't have something to put up a collateral or they don't know you, they're not friends of yours, um, they're going to want a personal guarantee. So um, unless you've been in business for five years, um, you know, or whatever their, the landlord's criteria is, mm-hmm. they're going to want a personal guarantee. Same thing with a bank loan. Um, they're going to want a personal guarantee, um, not just your LLC. So it's great in concept, um, but in practice, um, a small, e- even larger entities still require someone to put their neck out. Got it. All right, so let's talk about estate planning, wills, trusts, financial power of attorney, medical power of attorney, living will. Uh, estate planning, I guess it's very important um, in regards to basically having – your um, estate, basically, where you're planning for the future. God forbid something happens if you get deceased. Um, there's wills, there's trusts, there's different types of um, paperwork that you can use, right, in order to basically uh, protect yourself. Tell me a little bit about estate planning. Uh, well, I mean, the documents you've discussed. Um, so a will, a living trust, a financial power of attorney, um, a medical power of attorney, and a living will. Um, so a will... You know, most people see on TV, see movies where the reading of the will. They sit in a room in the lawyer's office, lawyer reads the will, um, and says, you know, little Jane gets this, you know, John gets this, uh, daughter gets this, brother gets this. Um, and then, you know, there's always someone that gets cut off that causes a scene. Um, so everyone generally conceptually knows what a will is. Um, the issue you have is um, if you do it, if you use a will um, with or without a will, um, anything that is still in your name after you die has to go through to some sort of probate process. Um, depending on its value. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, you own a car, um, you own a house. If the house is in your name um, and there's no co- joint uh, joint tenant owners, um, it's not in the trust, um, and there's no deed upon death, for example, um, the house has to go through probate. Um, the problem uh, with going through probate is if you have personal creditors, so your American Express, your Visa card, um, they have to be paid out of your assets um, if you go through probate. Um, so um, the purpose of using a trust is if your house is owned by the trust, and when you die, you owe ten thousand dollars to your credit card. Your credit card company can't go after your house or require that your house be sold to pay that ten thousand dollar credit card. Whereas, if you did not have it in a trust and it was still in your name and went through probate, they could require that to be paid. Either your beneficiaries pay it, or your house gets sold to pay that ten thousand dollar credit card. In this hypothetical, mm-hmm. um, so um, you still have a will um, because it, 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 if you have children under eighteen, you can appoint you appoint your legal guardians if the other parent um, is no longer with us mm-hmm. either. Um, and then uh, it's, it's a legally binding um, determination of what you want to do with your body after you die. So I want to be cremated. I want to be buried. Um, I want everyone to wear white at my ceremony. I want certain music to be played. Um, you get you know, kind of odd requests, but um, I want ashes to be buried on the Brooklyn Bridge by my brother. In, in exchange for that, he gets my truck, uh, things like that. Um, a will <laughs> is in there. Yeah, that's an actual example. That's why I use that one. It's, it's kind of specific. Um, but Is that uh, a real one? Yeah, it's a real one, yeah. It wasn't his brother; it was his friend. But and his friend declined, declined the truck in exchange for it. So he didn't. He didn't do that. But where does the truck go? Government? Uh, no, the truck went to his brother um, because his friend didn't. His friend did not want to drive his truck to Brooklyn to uh, spread his ashes on the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, hmm. So uh, the truck did not go to the, did not go to the friend. Went to the brother. But um, yeah. So the idea is a will. Uh, you still need a will no matter what. Um, if you have a trust, you normally the will is normally called a pour over will that says everything I have. 
if I forget, if I forgot to put it into my trust, open up probate, dump it into the trust. Mm-hmm. Um, so you transfer your house into the living will. You transfer bank accounts. You open a bank account titled in the name of the trust. Um, you open up a savings account paid for by that bank account. You can store things in there um, that are owned by the trust when you die, like a safe, a safe deposit box. Um, you get an assignment of personal property that says everything in my house is owned by my trust. Um, you have life insurance that has your beneficiaries and your last beneficiary is your trust just in case everyone in front of it has passed away. Um, same for retirement accounts if, you, if, the, if your retirement account allows you to do that. Um, same with bank accounts, PO, uh, pay on death beneficiary, mm-hmm. um, use the trust as the last resort. Most bank account, most banks have issues with a trust, contingent beneficiaries, but mm-hmm. um, so it is you do that. So I know the one thing that you're doing to help people in Clark County as well that you've mentioned to me that you were willing to do is doing a free simple will for people, um, especially, you know, I, I think that we believe that everybody should have a simple will because God forbid the time comes, so knock little. on wood here. And the bottom line is, is that I know that you were going to basically go above and beyond to basically help people in Clark County by doing a free simple will. And I know that on the Las Vegas Legal Network on the uh, Progressive Web app, which is lvln.vegas, that basically people can go online, fill in the information in order to get a free simple will, and then an email would be sent to you, and then you basically would call the client and basically set up a free simple will. But if it gets more advanced, how would that work, the free simple will, with you helping people in Clark County? And then if it got more advanced, you know, what can fees be, you know, roughly just for protecting themselves of a simple will? Because everyone should have a will, right? Correct. Everyone should. Um, I mean, if you have, if you have in Nevada, um, if you have children, um, the default is if you die without a will, if you have a children, no spouse, the children inherit. If you have no children and a spouse, spouse inherits. Um, so, I mean, there, there's, there's specific, uh, specific waterfalls that shows um, how people uh, inherit based on uh, with or without a will. Um, if you have a will, you can specify. So you can specify who gets what. Um, if you don't have a will, the Nevada law governs who gets what. Um, rarely will it ever go to the state of Nevada <coughs> general fund. Um, it goes to your kids, family, okay. grandparents. It goes up and over and then up and over and up and over. Grandparents, aunts and uncles. But you save a lot of money by having a will because it's uh, to probate, right? And Correct. if someone wants to fight for your assets. Yeah, with a will, the person you appoint as your executor can live outside of the state of Nevada. Mm-hmm. If you don't have a will, um, the person has to live in the state of Nevada to be appointed as an administrator. Um, so um, it's not uncommon for someone to live here, own a house here, their children being California, Arizona, Maine. I've got clients in Michigan um, that are probating a case here. Um, and so uh, if you have a will appointing them, it doesn't matter where they live. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't have a will, the person has to live in Nevada. So you have to find someone that can be your, exec- or your administrator here in Nevada. Um, without a will. Um, but yes, so for the free wills, a simple will, um, primarily it's, you know, I, John Doe, um, uh, give everything to my, these four people, these children, um, or uh, my brother, my sister, um, and my two children equally, or 50% to my kids, 50% to my brothers and sisters equally. If you start getting into creating a, creating a, um, a trust outside of that, um, or you start getting to where you say, I want, um, you know, these items to go to my brother, and then here's an inventory of, of you know, a thousand items. Twenty of them go to my, my uncle, fifty go to this. That's not a simple will. This is, this is um, for people. More advanced. Who, yeah. So I want my, my guardian to be, uh, for my children to be my brother, um, and I want um, to be buried or cremated, and I want my assets to be equally divided among these eight people or these four people. Um, those we do for free. Correct. Got it. So the bottom line is, if you want a free, simple will, basically William Devine, basically attorney, basically that's helping people in Clark County, they go to the Las Vegas Legal Network, the the app, which is www.lvln.vegas. They can fill the information. It'll be sent to William. William will call you and set up the paperwork and meet as well to go over what options you have. And I really appreciate you doing that through the network because it's something with regards to the problem solver. The reason why you know I'm trying to help people, but I can't do it all one. I'm not an attorney. I'm not providing legal services. So I'm basically you know sharing where people should go, who to call. You know whether it's United Way, Catholic Charities. Um, food banks, distributions, employment, housing. I try to basically guide people where to go, different resources, give them two, three options. But a lot of people were basically calling for different attorneys where they got accident or injury or probate. And so basically I needed to start basically a referral network, which was Las Vegas Legal Network, in order to basically refer people out 
But I want to have good attorneys, you know, like yourself, that are basically going to be on top of it, calling people back. And as they always say, basically, a lot of lawyers basically, you know, they get busy. There's poor communication. I want to make sure that basically that we have a good network of attorneys that are going to call people back and be on top of their game, because I don't want to refer someone that basically is not going to be efficient and do a good job, you know, for people. So that's why we have this interview process and, and we make up the network. So I'm really glad that you're part of the network because I believe that you're you're so detail oriented and organized, um, especially with communication. I think that you're going to be an asset to all the people that call you know las vegas legal network and basically need legal help or even myself the problem solver when they basically people call you know refer them to you specifically what else are we missing here in regards to um without getting so advanced living trust power of attorney i mean i know if people have medical stuff there's power of attorney medical power of attorney you know um what is it healthcare proxy you know? yes so um so we, we talked about a will and a trust um so the next one is medical um so uh, there's, a, there's a financial power of attorney um that says that it takes the rights that you have and, and, and grants them in addition to you to someone else. Um, so you can say that um, as soon as I sign it, uh, my spouse has the, has a general power attorney, general durable power attorney, so that if something ever happens to me, um, if there's anything like my 401k that I have not yet added her on, um, that she has the right to manage that for me. Um, or you can say that when I become incapacitated, uh, my child, uh, my, my 20-year-old son or my 30-year-old son or whatever, um, has the right to make medic financial decisions for me. That's a financial power attorney. Um, the financial power attorney is only valid while the person that granted it is alive. So if 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 I die, my financial power attorney dies with me. Um, a medical power attorney, same thing. Um, also, you'll hear them online called healthcare proxy. Um, here we call the medical medical power attorney. Um, it grants um, someone the right to make medical decisions on your behalf if you are unable to make decisions on your own. So if you're uh, you know, if you go, if you ever go into hospital for surgery, one of the first questions they're going to ask you is, um, once they get you settled down, is do you have a medical power of attorney um, who has the right to make decisions for you? Mm -hmm. um, by default, by Nevada law, your spouse already has that right. You can't take it away from them. Um, so if you have a medical power of attorney that grants, you know, your brother the right to make decisions, your spouse still overrides that. Um, is that something the medical power of attorney? Is that just like a simple form? It can be. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is we, we merge the medical power attorney with a living will. We call it an advanced directive, medical directive. Um, so it says that when I become incapacitated or I can un unable to make medical decisions um, for myself, um, this is the person. And then if that person can't, isn't available or um, does not want to do that, then this next person is in line. Um, and then uh, you, you, in addition to that, you have a living will portion. Um, so Nevada says that it, a few situations – you're basically illegally dead, um, and so in those situations, you're allowed to um, authorize someone ahead of time to withdraw life support. So if you've, you know, terminal disease and you're going to die in three months, and you're on life support, and that's the only reason you're alive, if you have previously decided, you can you can authorize someone to withdraw life support, um, and it's not assisted suicide, it's not murder, because you've you've basically legally have legally died. Legal already. paperwork to basically state Correct. that. Correct. I know it was really big. I mean, for years, healthcare proxy, but is healthcare proxy at words? That are from different states is just is it called medical power same power attorney here same thing it's, it's, it's exact same thing healthcare some states call it healthcare proxy some states call it a medical power attorney um, and so but it's it's it's, it's a conceptually the exact same thing um, Nevada has um, Nevada calls it a medical directive um, well excuse me medical power attorney um, and then you have the living will so we merge them together um, uh, but the state of Nevada has it's called a living will a living will lockbox um, so um, every client that we ever do a, me a medical directive for. Um, that specifies uh, their wishes and living will wishes. Um, it's free to register with the state of Nevada so that if you ever go to any hospitals in the state of Nevada, um, the doctors um, and nurses there have access to that. What is it, living? Living will lockbox. It's operated by the Nevada Secretary of State. Is that something you just go on the Nevada Secretary of State website? Yep, yep. there's a, a form for it. It's a two-page two or front and back form. Um, you fill out, um, you mail a copy, you mail that form with a copy of your um, uh, medical directive or a living will, depending on if you. So have there's a database. Not. Yep, and they scan it. State database. They scan it. Keep electronic copy. Um, it's protected. It's accessible by your name and social, um, but only by authorized representatives. Generally, doctors and, and nurses at hospitals, mm -hmm. not at their private practice at their house, um, or I'm sorry, private practice near, near your house. Got it. Um, I didn't know about so, that. Uh, yeah, so you get that. Um, they'll give you a card, kind of like an insurance card, you can put in your wallet um, with a registration number, verifying you have it. Um, and so when you go in and they ask you, do you have a medical directive? Um, you can tell them I've, it's filed with the state of Nevada, and then they go to the, they go to the terminal, pull it up, it up, and they can print out a copy and stick it in your file. I like that. I don't know about that. Yeah. I got to basically, I think with the Las Vegas Legal Network, I think we need to address the uh, medical power of attorney 
and then this uh, living will lockbox to basically somehow get that included oh, yeah, for people. Of course. And again, it's not like a lot of people are basically using it, but as I think that you know, recently we've um, connected with the United Way and stuff like that. The two one one number where basically going to people will start you know when they ask for referral services, living will, healthcare proxy. There's no one basically that's doing that or helping people, you know, for free services, at least in the beginning, which I think it's great for any attorneys to get back in some regards of like pro bono. Um, and it's simple form sometimes, unless it gets more advanced with different people, different situations. All right. So um, one thing to share as well is we get a lot of phone calls from people that are basically in prison. So same thing, like those people in prison should also have, right, medical power of attorneys, living wills. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's not uncommon for military, not the, not the group military with prison, but um, military member that is outside of the state of Nevada um, or outside, you know, a, a, apart from their spouse um, to do a financial power of attorney um, because if they're, if they're overseas um, and they can't uh, access their bank accounts, they can't uh, sign contracts on their own behalf, they can't sign a lease, they can't buy a house. <coughs> Um, so it's, it's not uncommon for someone in the military who's going to be stationed overseas to have a financial power attorney with their spouse or girlfriend, but usually girlfriend, boyfriend, um, but usually spouse, um, uh, and a will. Um, so um, you know, if you're going to go on active, go on active deployment, um, it's also not uncommon um, for them to have their JAG officer uh, go through a provide everybody with a, with a method of creating a will before they go on active duty. Um, so that's a common issue too. Interesting. Um, but yeah, medical power attorney, same thing. Um, uh, but I mean, if they're that that only really works if they're if they're if they're in prison here, um, then yeah, of course they're going to want someone to uh, uh, give them the authority to make medical decisions on their own. What is the last topic? Of basic is probate. Tell us a little bit about probate. Um, not that any of these topics are very exciting in general. <laughs> probate when someone basically passes away, and they basically um, have property, have assets, have LLCs, have all the things we talked about. Um, and I know there's ways of avoiding probate, so it doesn't cost that much money in general. Real quickly, uh, you know, tell me a little bit, a little bit about probate. Uh, so, I mean, uh, one thing, that, if we've done our job right, you should never have to go to probate. Um, if, you're, if, you, if your attorney's done a job right, you should never have to go to probate. Um, or if your attorney's done your job and you followed through, um, you should never go to probate. Uh, but the idea is, if you, have, if you have assets in a trust, it skips probate. If you have, um, in Nevada, you have a, called a deed upon death, NRS 111 deed on death, that says, when I, that says when I die or the owners of the property die, the house goes to person B. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the child. Um, that skips probate. Um, you have a, a POD, a pay on death beneficiary for bank accounts, skips probate. You have a TOD, a transfer on death designation for the Nevada DMV. Um, so if you have a vehicle that's paid off, you can put, uh, you know, your son, daughter, brother, mother, whomever mm -hmm. um, on, the, on your title as a, as a death beneficiary, contingent death beneficiary. Um, it avoids probate. Um, but yeah, the idea is if you go through probate, you have, you open a case, um, whatever assets a person owns, their house, their bank accounts, their cars, the mo three most common things. Um, or if they have a life insurance policy and the beneficiary has died and there's no other beneficiaries listed, um, which is not as common as you believe. So the idea is you probate it, you open a probate case, um, notify, you notify everyone um, that uh, this person has been appointed as the executor, you know, the, the, the spouse or the, 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 the daughter or the sister has been appointed as an executor. Um, creditors have a, a statutory period of time to file claims. Um, so if, and including Medicaid, so if, if, if the person had died is, is elderly and they were at hospital covered by Medicaid, Medicare, um, then, uh, you know, you get a 20, 30, 50, 60, I've got a 62,000 Medicare claim requiring the sale of a house, mm -hmm. um, that has to go through probate, but had the house been in a trust, it wouldn't have to do that. Um, so the idea is to, to plan ahead of to not do that. Um, but the idea is it takes, it's, the idea is creditors have the ability to be paid out of an estate. Um, so if you have assets when you die and you open up probate, creditors file claims, you get paid. Um, but the idea is the, the reason you um, you have a trust in this case um, is to avoid the need for probate. So any assets that are held in a trust, skip probate. You don't even have to open probate at all. Um, sometimes you have to open up probate so the, the if there's a mortgage um, and the person wants to refinance it or, or assume it, um, sometimes we have to open up probate, get a special, admin, uh, special administrator appointed, solely to deal with a few limited issues, but not yeah. actually transfer assets. Um, but, um, but yeah, the idea is to try to avoid probate. So the bottom line is, um, I know we're finishing up on all these different topics, and um, the bottom line is if, if someone needs help, whether it's Chapter 7, Nevada Asset Protection Trust, the form formation of a, a business or LLC for real estate or for property or for assets, estate planning, wills, trusts, financial power of attorneys, medical power of attorneys, living wills, or probate. A lot of these things are all about financially related legal topics to help protect people and their 
um, assets and their interests. Correct. Especially their life. Either, their either life is their fix, interest, right? Yeah, their fix body. A, fix a problem. Fix a problem they're having now. It may be a bankruptcy. It may not. Um, it may be defending a lawsuit. Um, it may be um, just simply taking the assets, swapping into a trust. Um, but uh, if it is, it's, it's primarily financial rated, correct? So I really appreciate you being on the show today. Um, every single week, like I said, we have awesome people coming on the show. You know, it gets very advanced. This topic is very, very advanced. Anything financial related, you know, protecting yourself in general like that. So the bottom line is, is that uh, free consultations, free strategy sessions, uh, free simple wills to basically help people. If you need any help whatsoever, William Devine basically can basically help you out with any questions. You don't have to be intimidated or afraid to talk about these topics. Or I think a lot of people, you know, they get... Um, they feel dumb, you know, talking about this topic. Even myself, I'm somewhat educated about the topic, but I still feel dumb, like, what should I do, you know? And everyone's different, right? Depends upon what assets. And your life now may be different than it was five years ago, 10 years ago, and who knows what your future may be. So if you know what the plan may be, everyone's different. But no matter what, the simple will basically is something that, that everybody basically needs. God forbid something happens, like I said, especially with COVID the last mm. year and a half with people passing, you know? Yeah, we had, there's, when, when it first started, we had a rush of calls. To get um, living wills. El elderly clients, um, panicking that, <coughs> to get a living um, will yeah to, to get a, a medical power of attorney financial power of attorney a trust um just to be prepared because they knew things prepared because what happens if i get sick and i die i want to make sure that my daughter gets everything without having to go through probate um and honestly many panic 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 it calmed oh. down after a few months but uh, when it first started um you know the news the news feeds a frenzy and um yeah anyone anyone had assets did not do any estate planning at all automatically was paranoid about it and just called every family, every, sorry, every probate attorney, every estate planning attorney in, in, in Nevada got, at least the, the ones that I've spoken to, got hammered. No, it's incredible what, what took place. Is there anything, as we uh, finish up the show, is there anything else that you want to add specifically that we missed, anything in general? I think we covered a lot of different topics and everyone's different, you know, situation. I think they just, they need to call and basically, you know, meet with you to go over some different items. But anything uh, specifically that you think that we left out? No, and I think we cover a lot of things. Um, the idea is, again, you know, if you're having problems, it's that's the number. Of, bankruptcy is not a bad word. Um, don't uh, don't listen to someone that tells you you should never file bankruptcy. Um, you've got uh, if the worst thing you could ever do is sacrifice your future, um, your future life, your future financial well-being, um, because you feel bad that you need to file bankruptcy. Um, the reason you get a credit card at 24% interest, that 24% interest pays for um, people who have financial problems and unable to, unable to, uh, to pay their credit card bill that end up filing a bankruptcy. Um, if you take a 401k and you got 200,000 in a 401k and you take 100 grand out to pay your credit card bills, um, 401k is protected. If you had done a bankruptcy, that's 100 grand you would have left mm -hmm. when you're 65 and retired. Um, so don't, before you take money out of a 401k, before you take money out of an IRA, before you take money out of a Roth IRA, um, to pay a credit card bill, I'd like to talk to you um, because um, it's, 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 it's heartbreaking to see someone that comes in, an elder client coming in, tell me, well, you know, three years ago I, I, my, my, I pulled money. I felt bad about um, not paying my American Express after I lost my job and got, you know, got disabled and I couldn't pay my bills. And so I pulled out 50 grand out of my retirement account to pay credit cards. And now I'm, I can, I'm only getting $600 a month um, plus my Social Security, whereas they would have gotten $1,000 a month plus Social Security. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, it's, it, it's not a massive difference, but it's, 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 it is a difference. So the bottom, yeah, I agree. I mean, especially with seniors and a lot of the older people in general basically need some help. So the bottom line is you're available, and I really appreciate you coming on the Problem Solver Show. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you being part of the Las Vegas Legal Network, which is something new for the last, you know, six months. And you know, like I said, the phone calls are coming in. We're trying to refer them to different lawyers, different resources. So, again, I really appreciate you being on the show. Um, again, um, I'm Dave Kohlmeyer, um, the Problem Solver, retired police officer, you know, of 17 years basically trying to help people in different ways, have different resources. Um, having a team now of uh, Las Vegas Legal Network, uh, a network of attorneys basically willing to help people. A lot of uh, discounted services, uh, just like the free simple will and different things that basically out there, even free traffic ticket representation that that some of the attorneys were willing to provide as well. So again, I'm Dave Kohlmeyer, The Problem Solver. Um, I appreciate you joining the show and listening in for some great information today. Every single week, we're, we're going to have someone special on the show. Again, any resources, any information you need help with, you can go to theproblemsolver.vegas. We have tons of resources you know, on the app that's available, as you see on the screen. If you're listening, basically, again, theproblemsolver.vegas. 
tons of resources. Click on the different tabs depending upon the problem that you have. Um, if you want to contact me, meet with me. There's, it's a free service that I basically provide as the problem solver, as a retired police officer, you know, going above and beyond to help people, you know, one problem at a time. And again, uh, you can reach me at 702-400-7474. Again, 702-400-7474. Again, I'm Dave Comey, the problem solver. Be careful, stay safe, and I'll see you next week. Take care.